Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Funding Ideas for Startups and Entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm Joe Larkins from Sereno Capital, and I'm one of three presenters today. Um, I especially want to thank Mark, who heads up the Emerging Technology Group at Abbott, Stringham & Lynch. So if you haven't met Mark, please introduce yourself. Um, just a couple words about Abbott. Abbott has over 70 employees, and it's very easy for large accounting firms like Abbott to focus on big companies. So Abbott not only embraces startups, but they hold events like this that are specifically geared towards small businesses and startups. So why do they do this? The reason is Abbott knows that small firms become large firms, and they actually appreciate working with firms on both sides of the spectrum. So again, a special thanks to Mark and Jill, who was here before, um, also Amanda Welch, that do a ton of work behind the scenes to make this kind of event happen. So I'd like you, as a thank you to Abbott and to Mark for hosting us and buying lunch for us and having us here, please think about one company that you know, one business that would benefit by having Abbott as their CPA firm and mention them to Mark or introduce them uh, today or sometime in the future. Okay, so today we're gonna go on a business financing journey. And the journey goes something like this. I've got a great idea for a company or maybe I've already started my company. And I'm not just talking about high tech. It could be a manufacturing firm like a machine shop a service firm like a staffing company, or maybe it's a hardware or software company because we're in Silicon Valley. And the way my company starts is I'm going to dip into my personal savings, which isn't going to last very long. Um, so my savings account's going to burn out. Now I've got some business cards. I'm able to promote what I'm, my services. So then the next step is I'm going to go to my credit cards because I've got a whole bunch of credit cards and I have nice limits on them. And so I'll run through probably three or four of those. Um, because two isn't enough. And, um, and then I get a little further along. And maybe now I'm starting to get some traction. Maybe I've got some revenue and some customers. But I want to get to the next step. So one of the best ways to fund a company is with friends and family financing. So Anson Liang from Trustleaf is going to present a novel approach to friends and family financing that provides security to both parties, the investor as well as the recipient. Um, I'm a huge fan of Trustleaf, and I know you will be too once you learn about what they're doing. So now I take on that investment and I'm getting further along and I have more customers, more revenue. Maybe I have a couple employees now. So my next step is looking at things like maybe an angel investor or venture capital. Or if I can't qualify for those or it's not the right fit, I might look to receivables, receivables financing, which is what I'm going to talk about. And then I keep growing. Things are going along now. I've got a couple years under my belt, more employees, more customers. Now I'm looking at possibly getting an SBA loan because I want to buy a piece of equipment that's important for my, my business to grow. Or I'm tired of paying rent because the building I'm in, I'd rather own it. So put that rent money towards equity. So we're privileged to have Ken Menina from Bridge Bank. And Ken's going to talk about SBA loans and bank financing and what it takes. Ken's originated and funded over $250 million in loans. And I'm going to stress so far in his career. So he's a uh, Listen closely when Ken talks about what it takes. So again, our concept today is 10 different small business financing options in 45 minutes. We believe a growing company that starts out and lasts for 10 years will likely use three or four of the options we're going to speak about today. And we're going to save time at the end for Q&A. So please try to hold your questions during the presentation portion. And without further delay, I'd like to bring up Anson Liang, the founder and CEO of Trustleaf. And th thank you, Joe. So uh, I'm Anson. I'm the founder and CEO of Trustleaf. So a little bit about my background. I've been an entrepreneur in the past six, seven years. I co-founded two startups uh, previously. My another company is called Jackery. Uh, it's a mobile hardware uh, uh, startup. Uh, we started uh, two years ago, and we grew the business in into a multi-million dollar revenue uh, company in just nine months. So I have some uh, like fundraising experience uh, for my previous startup. So that's why I'm here to, to share my experience. Um, so first of all, when people talk about fundraising, definitely think about uh, different re resources. And we are in Silicon Valley. People usually talk about angel investment and VCs. But oftentimes, people rely on other uh, channels, especially on friends and family. 
We, we actually gathered some data from the market research and also uh, the SBA. Uh, what we find is friends and family is the second largest capital source of startups, not just tech startup for any kind of business. 38% of people like raise money from friends and family, they usually borrow it or they probably use like different forms of a vehicle to structure the, the, the financing. And on average, people borrow about 25,000 and pay it back in about 18 months. But it very uh, depending um, on, your, on your business model. Some people borrow mm -hmm. just like a few thousand bucks to get it started, but people can, can borrow up to like a million dollars for your, for your business from your friends and family. There are a couple of things you probably need to be careful and also need, you need to make sure you do it in the right way because otherwise it will affect your relationships. And one of the most important thing is to set the right expectations, especially for friends and family with your, with your uncle or maybe with your parent. Sometimes they don't expect you to pay back because they have, you have a very close relationship with them. But if they don't expect you to pay back, you, you better like put it into writing instead of like just a verbal agreement. Hey, I'm going to uh, give you this amount of money. And so, so if you, you have kind of a fuzzy uh, expectation at the beginning, it will really affect the relationship down on the road. So most importantly, get it into writing. And, uh, and also you need to think about how to structure uh, even with friends and family, it's like you can do it as a gift with zero interest rate, or you can do it as a personal loan. So like, I'm I'm I I am the person borrow the money, and I'm going going to be liable to pay you back the money. Or you can structure it as a business loan if you already have a business entity. Uh, you can structure that, and as like the the company or your LLC will pay back the loan, and. Also, people often talk about equities, like you can sell your share to your friends and family. But be aware that um, you need to really communicate with your friends and family to understand uh, what they know about the structure. Because more, most of the people, they don't know about, like people talk about convertible note, equity in Silicon Valley, but for a lot of people, they just don't understand that. They only understand interest rate and when are you going to pay me back. So set it up as a personal loan or a simple structure. Make sure I set the expectation right at the very beginning. Um, there are some platform and tools to help you to do your friends and family. Uh, the most easier thing is just find legal documents online. So LegalZoom and Rocket Lawyer will uh, help you to do that. Um, you pay uh, about $10, $20 for legal document, you set it up and you just send it to your friends and family. Um, but what we find out with, um, in this process, it's not just about the document. That's why we actually started TrustLeaf. Uh, what we do is we make it easy for you to ask money and structure the loans online. So you tell your story on our platform, set up a fundraising campaign, and then you invite your friends and family to pledge the amount they feel comfortable with. And then they sign the legal documents online. We help you to basically structure the loan and generate uh, all, the, all, the, all the loan documents. And then after what we help you to... Yes, you have a question? Oh, okay, sorry. So, um, yes, yeah, so we also help you to manage the loan in the entire uh, repayment process. So. Uh, it, the platform also makes you look more professional and instead of just asking the loan from maybe your parent, your uncle, now you can send it out to your like tens or twenty of your friends and family and you don't need to worry about like, like basically going through uh, uh, one, one, one to one conversation with them. So it makes it really easy in the entire process. And after you get the money um, from your friends and family, and then we are going into the, the next funding resource, uh, resources. So a lot of people talking about cloud funding nowadays. It's a really popular term. But I want to make sure you understand like, what is cloud funding. 
So there are two types of crowdfunding we usually uh, talk about is a reward base and donation base. So reward base, you uh, the people give me the money and then I just like try to pre-sell the product I have. Like I would give them uh, the, the product when it's ready or the just donation base, like they just give the money uh, as a donation to, to support our business. Even though you heard about like the really big success on the press, like people raised a uh, million dollars for their fundraising campaign, but that's really rare. It's just like they, they are they're kind of uh, at the, only at the 1% tier. Most of people only raise about $5,000 from their crowdfunding campaigns, and the successful rate is really low. It's actually less than 20%. We get the data from uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and that uh, and that's uh, what we have found out. Um, the average campaign length is anywhere from 30 days to 45 uh, days, and typically they would recommend you to do it in a relatively short period because uh, you don't want to basically uh, make the whole process too long. Otherwise some of your funder may leave uh, at the middle of the process. And you need to be aware of the cost. Um, it's not cheap to do a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, for example, Kickstarter can charge you about 5% as a commission fee, and also another 5% for the transaction. Like Kickstarter use uh, Amazon payment to process the payment, and Indiegogo use PayPal. So both of them charge a pretty high transaction fee, around three to five percent. So you need to take those costs into consideration, uh, like compared to the amount you're raising on the platform. And when you talk about crowdfunding, a lot of example, especially the the good example you you see on the press, is about hardware or the creative product. And we, we are now in, in the age of like internet of things, smart devices. People basically, they, they build their prototype and then after that, they put it, pull up a crowdfunding uh, campaign. Why they're doing this? They're not really looking for the money. They are actually doing the marketing on the crowdfunding uh, platform. So what I would say is, uh, for many of the successful uh, crowdfunding campaign, the number one reason they want to do it is for marketing. And to have a to do a successful campaign, there are a couple of things you can you can follow. Have a compelling story. Talk about like how you build your prototype, how you engage with your customers, um, how you reach out to. To, to a bigger audience, basically tell the story and uh, show uh, pictures, images, and you need to have a very uh, high quality video. And you can hire a photographer or uh, there are some uh, video uh, studio in, in the Bay Area. It costs you anywhere around a few hundred bucks to a few thousand dollars. So you can also take that into uh, the consideration of the cost of running your campaign. And uh, the last thing is you, because it's for marketing, so you need to put in uh, a lot of efforts to promote your, your, your campaign. Usually you can start out with your uh, friends or family first, like to just get the first 20% uh, funding from, from your friends and family for your crowdfunding campaign. And then after that, uh, the crowd will, basically you will get the attention from, from the rest of the people on the platform. And I, I actually ran a crowdfunding campaign for my other company called Jackery. So uh, we were raising uh, 100,000 and at the end of the campaign, we actually uh, reached like 200% uh, of, 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 of the funding goal. So what we did is we reached out a lot of uh, press and media and uh, just like pitch them our story, and at the same time, throughout our entire uh, fundraising process, we, uh, well, the, the campaign process, we 
we, we keep them updated, we just like feed them uh, news and how people think about our product, our, our, um, the, the feedback from our, our users. So really try to engage with the media and the press so you can get more exposures during the process. <coughs> um, so a few familiar names, uh, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and the other one is called GoFundMe. Um, the, the bottom two are really good tools when you try to prepare your uh, fundraising uh, campaign on Kickstarter. One is called uh, CloudLock and KickSpy. You can filter by category, you can filter by uh, the time and uh, whether they are successful or not. So you can do a little research in the past uh, to see uh, why they are successful. So, so get, get you prepared for, for, for your crowdfunding campaign. And then the next one, I talk about peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending. Uh, how many of you have heard about um, Lending Club or Prosper? Good. So peer-to-peer -peer lending is uh, basically they they has a they have a middleman platform that help you to uh, gather the demand from the borrower, and also they have another side, the supply side from 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 the lender. They, they try to uh, match you between the borrower and, and the lender. So you can borrow money on those peer-to-peer -peer uh, platform in a relatively short, uh, basically with a very short application process. You don't need to wait like one or two months to get your loan. You can get your loan within a day or within a week as long as you uh, give your credit score to, uh, to, to uh, Lending club. The loan size is typical, typically range between a few thousand to up to thirty-five thousand. And the interest rate they advertise the the uh, in the lowest interest interest rate is about seven percent. But uh, what I understand is the normal interest rate, like for people, uh, the the average interest rate is actually about uh, fifteen percent because of uh, your credit score. And most of the loan on Lending Club and Prosper are structured as personal loan. So you are personally liable to pay back those loans. But they also recently uh, launched uh, another uh, platform for business loan. But for that one, you need to have at least two years or 18 months of business record. Uh, you need to have your uh, tax filing to IRS. So they look into your accounting to decide how much money or how much, uh, what, what would be the interest rate they can uh, lend to the money. So peer-to-peer -peer, uh, lending platform is getting very popular and it has attracted a lot of attention uh, from the big banks. Like for example, uh, I, I want to remember it's Goldman Sachs or uh, JP Morgan actually uh, invested in, in lending club. They put in a lot of money uh, into in, into those peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending platforms just to lend out the money to uh, to to the to, to the people. So so the last one is uh, what we call the traditional uh, funding in the Silicon Valley through angels and VCs. Uh, most of them are equi equity based. Like uh, we have some data for angel investor. They invest about 20 billion per year. Uh, they do about over uh, 60,000 investment, and there were over uh, 200,000 active angel investors in the country. For VC, uh, they invested around the same number per year, about 22 billion, uh, but they only do about a few thousand deals per year, and there were about 400 plus uh, active VC firm uh, across the country. Well, but definitely when you talk about VC firm, I mean Silicon Valley should be the place. So for angel and seed round, we are typically we are talking about anywhere from uh, 50,000 to a million. So we consider that as an angel round. So that is for you to build a prototype, get your first customer, find your product market fit. Um, and now the 
Commodore Mono has become the standard because it's easy to set up. It has a very low uh, cost of like uh, legal, so you don't need you don't actually need to uh, go for a lawyer to set it up. Uh, a couple of things for Commodore Mono, you if you haven't heard about it, so basically it is set up as a loan as a debt financing first, and when you raise your Series A, uh, those those money would be converted into equity. So the first part would be the typical loan uh, terms like 6% interest rate, and people usually set it up as a uh, 18 to 24 month term, uh, term. So that's kind of the runway you should expect to get your startup into the next stage to get uh, Series A uh, financing. And when the loan convert into equity, uh, so usually it will take 20% discount uh, on, on the amount. So for the investor, because they are the early stage investor, so they can take the advantage when they uh, convert into uh, equity in the Series A round. So they take 20% discount and it set a valuation cap uh, uh, at that point. So for example, at Series A, you are, your company is valued at 5 million. But for the early stage uh, investor, your the cap would be basically the valuation will be capped at three million, and you you calculate the percentage of equity you will be able to receive based on that. Um, for C Series A, so um, typically you you will expect at least a million dollar for a Series A round. Um, post post valuation, um, I got the data from Angel Angel List, so. Uh, in the Bay Area, Bay Area is about anywhere from two million to five million uh, for actually on the lower end, but on the higher end you will see the post variation anywhere from ten million to twenty million, even to uh, fifty million. So, and also because it's set it up as a uh, equity based uh, investment, so uh, you will expect to have a bought seat for your um, for your lead investor in your Series A round. So they will be able to kind of uh, uh, control or give, give, give their opinion on the direction of the company. So the last thing is, uh, not everything is online. So for <laughs> angel and VC investment, it's the same thing. Uh, angel is almost become the standard for uh, angel investment. So Every startup should have a profile listed on AngelList, and they have just many, many of the uh, famous or uh, good investor, angel investor, especially on on the platform. Uh, Gus is another one similar to AngelList. Uh, there are some new platform coming up. Uh, one is called WeFunder fun, fun, uh, Funders Club. So they also help startups to raise money from angel and professional investor they uh, they also have the uh, angel investor to look for deals and help you to structure uh, everything in the process so that's 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 what i would like to touch about so uh to so just just to, to summarize my my section is like cloud funding has been uh really popular nowadays and actually the the model of crowdfunding has been apply to many different uh, financing structure, not just about friends and family. Um, so it also applied to uh, angel and VC uh, funding. And with uh, actually with the change of the SEC regulation, we will expect another boom of cloud funding when they open, like allow non-accredited investor to in invest into startup with uh, the equity option. So. With that said, um, that's, that's the end of my part. Thank you. I'm Joe Larkin with Sereno Capital. And today I'm going to talk about financing that's quite a bit different than what Anson presented. And then we'll get into some better <coughs> financing uh, later on. So I'm going to start with factoring and account receivable financing, which is what my company does. 
How many people in the room are familiar with factoring or AR finance? Okay, so that's, we got about half, which is pretty good. So everyone else is going to become an expert in the next five minutes, and I will keep it interesting for the folks that just raise their hand with a couple of case studies. So what is factoring or invoice discounting? How does it work and what's the process? The steps are pretty simple. Uh, my business, we, we purchase invoices from clients. So the benefit that this gives them is they get cash immediately. So as soon as they finish a service or they deliver a good, as long as it's completed, I'm willing to purchase that before the time frame when they would normally get paid, which is typically 30 to 40 days. So the client receives immediate cash, the customer pays the factor, and then I rebate back a reserve to them. Um, I'd like to do the picture better. So um, essentially I work with my clients. They produce goods and services, sell them to their customers. The next step is if they choose to, they can sell invoices to me. They can sell them immediately, which is right after they've completed their good or service, or they can wait some time. Um, I have some clients that are on net 60 type terms, and they actually wait 30 days, so they age their invoices. Um, and so then I'll provide that payment to them when they want it and when they need it, and then 30 to 40 days later I get paid. So what does this bring to a company that needs cash or, or is growing, especially growth companies and especially companies that can't obtain bank financing yet? Um, they have immediate cash for expansion. I don't have any minimums. They can factor in one month or factor any particular invoice in a month, and then the next month if they don't need it, they don't do it, so there's no cost in that regard. Um, this is off balance sheet financing, so there's no debt that's generated. It's not like a loan where you're listing it on your on your uh, on the balance sheet uh, from from a debt perspective, and then different from some of the other options we talked about, I don't take any stock or equity in the company, so I don't take any ownership. Um, it's a it's a transaction that's self-contained, and when the transaction is completed, it's over, and then we either do it again or we move forward and um, and do something else. Um, clients get to choose how and where they invest their funds, so I don't have any say. Once I provide financing to a client, they can do whatever they want with it. I would like them to put it back into their business so they can grow their business, um, but they have complete flexibility. And in this regard, um, this also helps clients because it really gives them the time savings, especially a very small entity where they're just starting out, they're, they're getting moving forward. Uh, collections can be time consuming, and I'm going to help with this process. So part of what I provide is, is a back office receivables uh, benefit to them. So businesses that commonly factor. Um, I mentioned manufacturing, things like machine shops, anyone building a good or, or a product that is delivered on a consistent basis. Staffing companies are great. Uh, temp services companies, any companies involved in outsourcing are great for factoring because they often get stretched from they put a person on site, that person's there for two weeks, well that person wants to get paid. Well now they're going to invoice at that time, now they might wait 30, 40, 50 days to get paid. So staffing is great. Um, trucking is also a very traditional uh, industry for factoring. Um, again, you think about a trucker that hauls goods across the country, gets to the East Coast, they could really factor that invoice so they can fill their gas tank up and drive another load back. So um, we're going to try and, if it's okay, we're going to hold questions until then. But I'll, I can come back to this. Um, and then startup companies, young companies that can't qualify for a loan. Um, this is one of the key areas that I focus <coughs> on around here because. Until you have a couple years of financials and a couple years of solid financials, it's very difficult to get lending. And so any business that has revenue, they could be a month old if they've got credit-worthy customers. So I'll go back up here. Um, I focus a lot on the customer side of the equation, but what's the creditworthiness there? Um, as long as they have that, uh, I'll consider factoring it, and I, I will probably do it. So any recurring business with a creditworthy customer is a candidate for factoring. Um, I'll do two quick case studies. They both have something similar in common, very different industries, very different businesses. This is a company that last year did around $600,000. Uh, they were break even. They weren't able to generate a tremendous amount of profits. The profits they did generate got put right back into the company. Uh, this year they've won a bunch of new contracts. Their business is growing tremendously. and. Um, it's a very small organization. They only have five employees here, but they're going to do probably close to two and a half million dollars this year. So for this kind of a company, what I can provide is seventy-five to two hundred thousand dollars a month of financing. And again, in this particular case, they need the money as soon as they ship the product because they're building more product on the growth curve that they're on. The key issue for this owner was equity. 
He wanted to hang on to his company. He had an option for an outside investor to come in. The investor was going to give him around $300,000, but one in 25, or I think it was 20% of the company. And what he calculated was, if he continues on this growth path, he was going to give away a lot of equity and a lot of future money. So he decided to go the factoring route, uh, which was going to save him money in the long run. And this came in through uh, his bank, because he wasn't able to get bank financing. Another quick case study, very different, very low tech. This company is involved in the printing business. Um, they hit the ground running from their perspective. They kind of spun out of another company, but they did around $100,000 in revenue last year. This year they're going to do around $300,000, so they're growing pretty rapidly. They only have four employees. In this case, we're providing ten dollars to $30,000 a month, depending on when they need it. Um, the key issue for them was they just don't have any assets. Uh, they rent their building. Uh, all their cash is, gets tied up in toner cartridges and other printing, printing supplies. And when they bring a new customer on, they have to buy additional toner cartridges and printing supplies. So uh, again, another kind of account that came into me through a bank. And the key for them is they're able to now generate cash quickly, and they use it when they need it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about asset-based lending, which is a, a little bit of a different class of financing, uh, but similar to factoring. What asset-based lending does, it provides a revolving line of credit that companies can access through assets they have on their balance sheet. Now, typically, the, those assets get discounted. So in most cases, you're talking about accounts receivable. You're talking about things like inventory. Um, and then maybe they have equipment in there that are all going to contribute to providing this line of credit from the financer, which is, in often cases, it's a bank. Um, ABL lines can go 500K and up. And what this does is, this provides a financing vehicle for companies. Maybe they hit a bump in the road. Maybe they lost a big customer. Um, something may have happened where they kind of hit a spot. Maybe they had other financing, but that financing got pulled because they violated covenants, or they couldn't meet some terms of a line of credit that, or a loan that they had before. So what this does for a company is it unlocks, again, some of these assets that are tied up that's what's going to be used as a collateral. So it gives them flexible financing covenants. They're not going to have to meet a profitability objective every quarter or multiple quarters in a row. Um, this also works great for companies that may have hit a bump in the road, but now they're looking to merge with another company or merge with a competitor that would make them both stronger. Um, growth financing, turnarounds. Essentially, in the asset-based lending world, you're able to get cash flow financing for a business that can't obtain bank financing or, or had bank financing and lost it. Um, I sort of started with this. We'll talk a little bit more about personal resources. There are a number of different places companies or new businesses or startups can turn to to initially get financing. So I've listed a bunch of areas here. I mentioned savings. I mentioned credit cards. Um, there are actually two very famous companies in the Valley. Uh, one of them is PayPal and another one is Google, uh, where both of the founders of those companies racked up enormous credit card bills to get their company started. So if you want to have fun sometime, Google um, you know, startup companies that you know, started out on, by burning up their credit cards. And uh, there's some great stories in there. Um, that's probably not the best path for all of us to use. And certainly things like the home equity line, you, know, you want to be careful what you're doing here. So I think the word of caution here is you can take things to a certain point, but you want to be careful what you're doing. Um, Again, you can do, now people are doing life insurance loans. If they have a policy, they can do a cash out value, possibly. 401k borrowing, which most people can do while they're still employed. Um, IRA borrowing with limitations. And then you can do a personal loan. Now, there are a lot of benefits to using your personal resources. The nice part about it is you maintain all your profits. You're not selling equity. So you own the decision-making process. You maintain complete control. And this gives you time to operate your business. Um, anyone who's done fundraising, Fundraising takes a lot of time, and in often cases, startup companies, the CEO's sole function is to raise funding or keep that funding pipeline going. So you're able to quickly get going and get moving. The disadvantages are you might burn through what you're planning on very quickly. You might not have enough cash. Or you actually become successful, which can be a challenge. And then you need more cash to fund your growth. So um, you want to be careful what you're doing here. Uh, and then probably the last thing is, Without an outsider or external advice, you lose this guidance. Uh, and also connections that investors can often provide that help a company. So
So I think that's what we have for this section. And Ken Medina is going to present bank financing and SBA. So we move on to the institutional uh, loan uh, portion of our presentation. And so I'm dressed uh, more to the institutional kind of way. And as well, uh, my uh, colleague Jason Brock is, I think, the only other guy in the room wearing a tie. I was one other gentleman back here. So, so we both work for a bank. And I'm going to uh, further that by standing behind the uh, podium. So my name is Ken Manina. I work at Bridge Bank. I'm asked to talk about bank financing and SBA loans. A little background about the bank. It was started in 2001. Um, Bank currently has total assets of about $1.6 billion. We're headquartered in downtown San Jose, which is our only branch office, actually. Um, I'm going to talk about SBA and commercial. The SBA group focuses exclusively in the state of California, and we've got loan production offices throughout the country. However, those loan production offices you see there in Texas, in Virginia, and in Massachusetts, those actually serve our, our technology division. Um, the bank actually currently has about 240 employees. The bank's grown about 10% per year since we started in 2001. And we have about six different divisions that actually function in a lending capacity. And we're going to talk about two of those today. The SBA, uh, which is within the commercial real estate group, because the SBA does focus on real estate as well as other things that we'll talk about. And then the corporate banking group, which um, provides financing. So conventional corporate bank financing, sometimes referred to C as CNI, or commercial and industrial financing. Um, in order to qualify for these loans, this is existing companies that have a track record. Generally, we'd want to see three years of positive upward trending sales with uh, commensurate profitability. Uh, management is in place. That is, it's been in place for some time. There hasn't been a recent, recent transition in management um, with a demonstrated ability with the, the uh, requisite industry experience. And um, always some financial reporting knowledge, some understanding of financial statements, balance sheet, income statement, cash flow. Obviously, you want the principals of the company to understand that and know how to manage their company to those financials. Personal credit, we also look at the individual personal credit. We run DNBs as well, but personal credit reports for us are a good indication of character and the, the individual's desire or ability or actual character, which is their desire to repay the loan. Um, the loans are secured with business assets, and you have your secondary repayment source and, and guarantees. Um, the commercial group focuses on two primarily products, term loans and lines of credit. The line of credit product is much like what, what Joe discussed. Uh, the term loans, um, generally a maximum of five years. They have a, a two to five year term, and they're designed to accommodate various requests that have to do with equipment, tenant improvements on a property, a project finance that may have to do with the launch of a new division, new hires, advertising, perhaps the company wanting to start e an ESOP. Uh, these loans are typically secured with a UCC filing on the business assets of the company. Lines of credit, this refers to what Joe discussed um, on the bank side, uh, basically designed uh, to support the current assets of the company, accounts receivable, uh, inventory, uh, any working capital need the company would have that has a seasonal nature to it. So, um, so that involves um, AR and inventory, of course, but it means that it has a revolving facility, much more flexibility than a term loan. When we get to talk about SBA loans, for what I offer and what Bridge Bank offers, those are all term loans. Lines of credit, much like your credit card, have the flexible nature of drawing down principal, paying interest only monthly, and then paying principal back when the uh, cash flow of the company will permit it through earnings. Um, we do do two types of, uh, of, of lines of credit, the formula line and then the non-formula line. Formula lines are where uh, a borrowing-based certificate is submitted monthly. Um, basically summarizing the accounts receivable, removing those that are ineligible receivables, perhaps those that are from a related party, a related entity, uh, foreign receivables, sometimes government receivables, sometimes concentrations within the receivable base. That certificate is sent in and that basically drives what the eligibles that the borrower can now borrow can draw down on. If they have a $400,000 line in place but they only have $300,000 in eligible receivables on that borrowing base certificate, then the maximum amount they can pull out is $300,000. Uh, lines of credit almost all have a 12-month term, so they're renewed annually, and they as well are secured with uh, a UCC filing on the business assets. So moving on to uh, SBA financing. Um, SBA financing, SBA stands for Small Business Administration. It's an agency of the federal government. It was started in 1953 um, to assist small businesses in many ways. Uh, one of those is with loan programs, loan guarantee programs. Um, the Small Business Administration funded about $23 billion dollars in loans in fiscal year end 930-2013. So that's 12 months of operations for the SBA. 23 billion, that's a big number. 
That's kind of the economy running well and the SBA being fully funded. Um, these, this program, the SBA programs, are actually zero subsidy. That means taxpayer dollars don't really go to finance the program. The program is financed out of fees collected from the applicants because I've been doing this for 22 years and over the years that the program has been in existence, it becomes somewhat of a political football um, where various sides, whether you know it's a, a Democratic or a Republican uh, um, a, a president or Congress, um, the program could be compromised through that. So they made it zero, zero, uh, zero uh, subsidy, and that helps the program to stay alive and not be subject to, to kind of the political winds that are blowing. So the two programs that we offer, and the two most <coughs> prolific programs you'll see out there, are the SBA 7A and the SBA 504. This, they're both term loans. The 7A loan is something that can be used for a wide variety of purposes, including what you see there, which is working capital um, on a term basis, of course, equipment, tenant improvements, business acquisition, partner buyout. We do a lot of debt refinance. And then, of course, the big bellwether, uh, owner-occupied commercial real estate purchase and construction. That's for small business owners that want to buy a, a building or build, construct a building to house their business. These loans go up to 25-year term. The SBA 504 loan, also uh, very popular, but dedicated exclusively to commercial real estate purchase and construction. SBA 504 can also be used for large uh, uh, fixed or capital asset uh, acquisitions. However, in my uh, years of doing this, I've deployed that program only for uh, real estate. The SBA 504 loan has a term up to 20 years. So we're going to talk about 7A loans because that's what's used for small businesses to fund them and to fund startups and small businesses that need working capital. The benefits are that all loans are fully amortizing. Um, these loans go up to $5 million, so they're sizable. Um, they have short prepayment penalties. In fact, on loans that have an amortization of less than 15 years, the prepayment, they do not have a prepayment penalty. The prepayment penalty is only on loans of 15 years or greater, which is generally a real estate uh, request. 10% um, down on a real estate purchase or a business acquisition, that's good. That means leverage is available. And the long terms we talked about, 7 to 25 years. 7 to 10 years generally for working capital and business acquisition. You can go out to 15 years on some tenant improvement loan requests and then 25 years, of course, for real estate purchase. The purposes, we just over, we already discussed, but you can see them there with amortizations up to 10 years on the balance sheet type of stuff and then amortizations up to 25, which I kind of removed from this slide accidentally, on the real estate um, loans. Uh, again, emphasis on owner-occupied. These loans, going back to this slide, I've got owner-occupied under, underscored there because these loans are not designed for investments. They're designed for small business owners that need to buy or construct a building to house their business. Um, so looking at startup financing and, st and businesses that have been re recently started up, the business plan, a lot of discussion about the business plan, what it should look like, what should be included, how long it should be. As, f as far as what I see and what I like to see and what, the and what I think most uh, banks that provide SBA financing want to see is a business plan that's concise and is objective. Probably not more than 10 pages. It's going to include everything we need. The three primary components that I see, market plan, organization plan, and financial plan. And then an executive summary that kind of encapsulates all of those. But the market plan is going to talk about the business itself, the industry it's in, the location, how that location is going to serve this business, the product or service to be offered, market analysis, including the discussion about competition, what they're doing, what they're charging, who they're serving, and how you're going to beat them. Uh, and marketing strategy, that is the sales. How are you gonna, how are you gonna affect sales? You're gonna hire people, you're gonna go through the internet, mail, newspapers, whatever you're gonna use. The organization plan talks about the management team, their experience, their credentials, and then um, the professional resources that are gonna be at the disposal of the, the new business. That is primarily their CPA, their attorney, and then perhaps um, some outside um, trusted advisor that might be assisting this small business owner in getting this thing launched. And then the financial plan, which is very important in the submission of a loan request, the income statement projections, the related assumptions, I should have that underscored, assumptions are absolutely critical, and then the balance sheet, which is with its opening entries. So looking at the income statement projection, generally 12 months is adequate, 24 months is asked on some larger loans, um, but the problem is, is once you get past 24 months, things get very fuzzy, nobody knows exactly where we're going to be with the economy and the environment. And, and also with the business and what your ambitions are. So 12 months is generally accurate, as appropriate or, or adequate, but 24 months is requested sometimes. Um, I like a monthly uh, a spreadsheet, like an Excel spreadsheet that has 12 months, each month lined up as one column. And you can see actually in there the granularity you need, which is gross sales. And you're going to show cost of goods sold, 
um, and then all the selling general, selling general and administrative expenses that would go below that. Um, and then at the end, the total on the right side, uh, which has percentages in it. That it is, I'm going to be able to see what the cost of goods sold is as a percentage of sales. I'm going to see what salaries is as a percentage of sales. I'm going to see what your occupancy cost, your rent is as a percentage of sales, in order that I compare it with other industry norms and see that it's in line with those for this area. Um, because rent will fluctuate, of course, geographically. As much granularity as is appropriate for the particular business. So if a business is going to have, if it's a service company and there's no, no, no cost of goods sold per se, then we don't want to see that. If it's a manufacturing company and you're going to have labor and materials and cost of goods sold, then we need to see that broken out. Supporting assumptions. What's your source for those assumptions? The assumptions are absolutely critical. A very simple example is uh, you're going to start a restaurant and you're going to charge, a, you're going to have an average cost per ticket that you're going to get. It's going to be $25 per ticket. And you're going to turn the tables twice at lunch and three times at dinner. So from that, based on the capacity, the dining area you have, we can kind of extrapolate what the top line revenue is for that, for that, uh, for that business and that industry. And that, that's kind of what we want to see with assumptions. How do you support how you're going to generate sales, how much those sales are going to be, and what are you, and what are you using to drive what your overhead is going to be, how much you're going to pay for your labor, your rent. We know what the interest expense is going to be because I know how much we're going to charge on the loan, but the rest of it should all be supported with assumptions, assuming it's a sizable, significant part of the P&L. Um, business should be profitable in 12 months. This is an SBA requirement. The SBA reasonably or not wants to see that all businesses will be profitable in the black by the 12 month of operations. So unfortunately, not all businesses fit. Some of them have a longer lead time, but the SBA wants to see that. So we ask borrowers sometimes to be a little op more optimistic than they normally would in order to show that the business will be profitable <laughs> in 12 months. Because after all, it is a projection. So um, the, yeah, nice. the, the balance sheet, the SBA does want to see a pro forma balance sheet. So we want to see how that balance sheet is going to look once the financing is in place and what the money is going to be used for. If it's working capital, it's going to go into a checking account. Um, if, okay, it's, cool. you know, if it's going to be used on equipment, we want to see that on there. So we just want to see the opening entries for all the debt and equity side of the balance sheet, and then the opening entries for all the asset classes that the money is going to be spent on. Um, SBA loans, qualification. So for existing businesses, we always look at three years of tax returns, federal tax returns for the business. For startups, of course, that's not available. Or recently started businesses, we might only get one tax return. Uh, we always look at three years of personal tax returns. Surely before you started this business, you had a job or another business, and you generated income, and we want to see how much that is. We want to see what kind of earning capacity you have. So we look for three years of tax returns. The SBA is very, very wedded to tax returns. They kind of take the position of people don't know how to prepare financial statements, and so we're going to look at the tax returns. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's not, it's not a fair assumption. It may not be an accurate assumption, but it's kind of a common denominator that they seem to adhere to. Um, the personal financial statement, we always get a personal financial statement when we're, um, when we're preparing these loan applications because we want to see what resources the applicant has personally. Namely, I want to see if they own a home or other real estate and if it has equity into it, in it because I'm going to get to a point where we talk about how we secure these loans and that has a lot to do with real estate security on SBA loans as a matter of course because the SBA requires it. So the personal credit report, we talked about that earlier when we talked about com uh, conventional loans, we do look at com uh, credit reports. It's kind of a tri-bureau report. We do look how they've handled their obligations in the past. It doesn't have to be perfect. We do not use FICO scores because we're a commercial lender. So people say, what happens if I got a 620 FICO? I said, I, I don't know. I mean, I know it's probably a lower end, but because I've, I've gotten a few home loans and people tell me what my FICO is. But other than that, we don't pay attention. We take a more qualitative approach to the credit report. We look at each, each account. We look at how they've been handled. And as is in most lending environments, if you've been late or delinquent on mortgages and big, you know, big important stuff like mortgages, that's a big deal. If you've had medical bills that have gone late and gone to a collection, that may be explainable. You know, if you've had a short sale, a lot of people have in the last few years, that may be explainable. It just depends. It's, it's a qualitative approach that varies from one application to the next. Related industry experience. Of course, for a startup, we want to see that you've had industry experience where you've been an executive and had responsibilities that are going to be commensurate with or close to what's going to be required of you to successfully run the new business. Eligibility for SBA loans. So moving to the right side. This is a big deal because folks don't always understand this, but the SBA doesn't want to help all businesses. They don't want to help publicly traded companies. They don't want to help Fortune 500 companies. They want to help small businesses, and they want to help going concerns. They don't want to help speculative businesses. So 
Personal guarantees are required as a matter of course. Anyone that owns 20% or more of the business, any entity that owns 20% or more, is required to provide a guarantee. And some of the stuff that Anson talked about, where you get VC funding or you get angel funding and you basically give up a portion of the stock or ownership percentage of the company, if you go over 20 with a VC uh, or an angel, they're going to be required to guarantee, and they're not going to want to do that. So you're kind of now prohibited from getting an SBA loan as a result of you giving up that ownership to one entity that's 20% or greater. Business size, what is small, so it's called the Small Business Administration. Um, we do have these guidelines here which apply to the SBA 7A loans, which are based on gross average sales over the last three years for retail and service companies, and based on number of employees for uh, wholesalers and distributors. Although I, I'm going to ask Jason, who's here, but I think we've deferred to 504 on these where the size standards are a little larger, haven't we? So, but these probably will come back, because in the SBA, throughout the, the, the financial crisis and recession of 2000, seven and eight, they loosened up a lot of this stuff to let more people into the program. But eventually, I think the 7A program will go back to these parameters for size standards. Ineligible businesses, this is something to pay close attention to because we get calls all the time on this. Anything that's speculative, investment real estate, non-owner occupied real estate, apartments, those are ineligible. A good distinction is like a motel is eligible and an apartment is not. The reason the motel is eligible is because the SBA defines it as the average stay of your client is 30 days or less. Whereas an apartment, the average stay is much more than 30 days. The SBA wants to help small businesses that are going concerns, that employ people, that have a dynamic of a business, not a passive investment like an apartment where you clip coupons and just cash checks every month. So investment real estate is out. Um, investment real estate for the SBA, when you try to draw a line between owner, user, and investment, the way you do it is basically the SBA gets recourse to the tenants of the company. The SBA ensures that there's a relationship between the ownership of the real estate and the ownership of the tenant, which occupies the real estate by requiring the tenant to guarantee the loan. The only tenant in the rational world that would guarantee a loan for his landlord is the one that's either the same or very closely related. So nonprofits are out, lending, any, ent any entity involved in lending, like you know uh, payday loans and stuff like that, that's ineligible. Gambling ent Gambling operations are ineligible. Speculative investment, again, ineligible. And churches or houses of worship, the federal government has decided to stay out of that in order to not help one potential religious group and not another. Um, client profiles, you can see it's basically everybody from manufacturing companies, including all the semiconductor and medical instrument distributors. Service professionals include CPAs, attorneys. We make loans to all of them. Software companies, contractors, subcontractors, and, ge and generals. Uh, brokers, of course, uh, retailers, property types, it's pretty much everything. Um, so the structure of these loans, these 7A loans that are used for businesses to help them capitalize, working capital, equipment, things like that on the balance sheet, they're always variable rate loans and they're tied to prime. The margin of over prime, it ranges, but it goes up as high as two and three quarters, which today would result in a, would result in a, uh, a, a rate of 6%. Fees, they're on a sliding scale. Currently, again, another promo program the SBA has, on the smaller loans, the, the fees are actually, the guarantee fee is actually zero. It goes up as high as 2.76 on the big loans, up at $5 million. So it's a lot of fees. And again, that's what helps to subsidize this program through the federal government. Terms, of course, we talked about that. It's up to 25 years. And collateral, UCC filing on the business assets. And then deeds of trust on commercial or residential real estate. The SBA business, we are always looking for ways to collateralize our loans. And that means the assets in the business and assets outside, the resources of the individual. Do they own property? Does it have equity in it? We're going to take a deed of trust on it. The SBA requires us to, so we blame them, but because it's a subject of great debate. Assignment of life insurance. Oftentimes, if the borrower doesn't own a home and the collateral is weak, otherwise we, uh, we get assignment of life insurance to secure the loan. A little bit more about our bank and um, about uh, me. That's Please. it. Hope I didn't go too fast. Thank you. No, that was great. Thanks, Ken.